The vice president has undergone their formal press junket by the time our magnate appearance casts itself within the Aloha, Oregon Police Department. Collectively, we flitter above quartz tungsten light and a juxtaposing slew of anxieties. Chronologically speaking, before our detective steps foot in the building, even the folks on Christmas Island know that the 53rd President of the United States has been fired upon on daytime television. You're listening to Episode 8 of Pulp, Surreal Stories from a Nearby Skull, an audio zine presented by the Sleepy Bones Detective Agency. The following broadcast is intended for mature audiences only. It is under these conditions that our detective finds themselves most comfortable. Their assignment brief is exactly that and they are hurried by admin into this bare interrogation room with their index card questions tucked into their breast pocket. In here, with us, the walls are all padded, an unusual feature likely part of the local refurbishments. The Aloha, Oregon Police Department did not exist three weeks ago. Our eccentric congregation inhabits a former psychiatric hospital, where this place served as board for a rotating cast of the criminally insane. Upon entry via push bar fire door, our touring detective finds the recent conversion increasingly apparent. I and Tiles simply sit atop foam flooring, afflicting a sensation of weightlessness to each foreboding step. Hard to make a dramatic entrance on the softness of roofed clouds. Another, someone out of our focus, pulls the door closed behind them. Our witness waits for a break in the silence, as several hours have ached their way around the clock face situated above the only exit. Incessant ticking, which echoes around the air as opposed to jutting through it. There will be no eye contact, not for the moment. Not until our detective glances upwards, assessing the situation. An apology is made, if only to clear the air. Poor timekeeping aside, very little else seems to come to mind off the bat. No. Strange. We... Our enamoured understanding are unable to grasp it, and instead simply continue to watch, unaffected by the events themselves. Formerly remote, our detective is unfamiliar with the locale, and therefore finds themselves without a seat. Standing now, and for the duration of the interview, they bide their time. First, we watch them prod their fingers into the cushioned walls. Soft, strange, against gnawed nails, impervious to worn nubs, troubling times indeed. Our witness will sit alone, then, at the understandably low table surface, which is made of thick, unforgiving metal, sat atop the singular chair. Similarly, this is made of an unidentified metal, thin, foldawayable. Our detective might assume it's part of a set, though they see no evidence. Nevertheless, metal. Quite a bit to hand, actually. Pulling their pointer away and then towards our scope, all notions of the overdue refurbishment vacate the premises, and we focus only on our detective. Smart to consider the 17, 16 possibly fatal outcomes of the looming conversation, they are regrettably quick to strike blunt force trauma off the list. Our witness, built like a tenured atlas, shakes uncontrollably, as though they have been spun by Kios himself. Simply put, they are in no state for a lengthy session, let alone a fit of rage, innocent of any charge. Their arms remain unrestrained, though they do not stay seated voluntarily. A cigarette, extinguished, sits in a ceramic ashtray next to a ballpoint pen, as though a Lower Oregon's risk assessment officer had taken indefinite sick leave. Continuing together, our extended vision looks upon the tape recorder, unbolted and essentially club-shaped, might as well be encased in a pre-shattered glass. Hush unbroken, barely stirred by the metallic wobble of sheet metal, or the vapid echo tick-tocking. Our accumulated animation takes it all in, each bead of sweat, every readjustment of gelled hair, any unusual glances towards the corners of this room, like where the PVC piping pokes out from a 2x4 sheet of missing force dampener. Only yesterday, it seems, a toilet was removed from this room. Fortunately, we detect no scent emanating from its leading depths, and so it is not brought up. We are, however, caught in the updraft of warring emotional states, like a cheap drone carried off by a lazy cyclone. From above, we circle the opposing forces, unconcerned vultures, unaware carrion. Our detective fighting against tired muscles, 
reaches to flick on the dictaphone box, a standard start to finish which will commence with the traditional reading of the current time and today's date, though both fall death to our bound receptors. Then, a brief description of our witness, their clothing, their eye color, and their date of birth, all done in the tone of a newsreader, an unavoidable quirk, nearly a joke even, designed to wrench a smile from our witness. It almost does, though stoically overcast quickly becomes an apt description of their sour Sunday weather report of an expression. Our expansive reclusion finds clear air and flutters downwards, coming to a gentle hover just above the two-leg tabletop. From this angle, there are hinges, short focal length now, with no reasonable effort. Our shared vision captures both our detective and our witness, as words are exchanged and roles are explained. A low Oregon police department requests a simple statement from our witness, one to encapsulate the nation-quelling event to which they were first responder. Nice and short now, our witness is okay with this, nodding with all the enthusiasm of Themis, sentencing themselves to the admission of murder, regardless of motive. Study our witness's preface to their oral biography, their shift in posture, zoom into their gullet as they swallow the lump in their throat, then catch the double take back up at the clock face. Our witness knew the vice president and the man who preceded him on a first name professional basis. In disgrace, our witness has removed their own name tag, but understand that they wore it with pride. Not a day would pass without them passing once or twice. As such, one might assume the same of the culprit. We needn't assume, as fuzzy visions of badges boasting in bad dreams are gifted unto our present compilation, wherein the silhouette of either one stands proud of their position. We can consider it either one, because our witness and the culprit may as well have occupied the same mortal vessel. Both, for one, were considered veterans of war, though the war in question was a vague one. In the memories we are holding, our tireless visage flutters through a harsh training regime, a rigorous selection process, and the passage of 17 focused years of trial and error, in barely the blink of an eye. Finally, lowered standards, the United States Secret Service. Only 1% of applicants ever make it to the tantalizingly entitled role of special agent. And then, there's the other impossible leap. For the best of the best sits the shield of kings, personal guard to the US president. A milestone shared with those we christen the culprit, a commendation achieved by only two at a time, with the election ratio selected seemingly at random. A goal set between barrack mates, who made the initial switch together following a glowing reference from their commanding officer. It is here, in a lower Oregon of all places, where the culprit revealed their true intentions. Flash forward a little, and the fuzz clears. A television broadcast, our witness has now seen the live footage themselves. Multiple angles, but in each one, there is a clock face visible. At the strike of three o'clock, in the midst of a press conference regarding recent civil disruptions, the culprit drew their weapon and fired a single bullet into space. All time would screech to a near stop here, as though Kronos himself had to take a look-see, slowed down for ourselves now, and for our witness then. Of course, nothing can be done as the projectile proceeds to pierce the president's skull reversing their mortal presence on contact. As we re-witness this historic moment, even our momentous gawp must rewind a tick to take in the second shot fired. A trigger finger trained for this very moment, instinct, muscle memory, our witness fires their own insight into the slowed time. A lower Oregon had been home to the culprit, as it had been home to our witness, our rejected point of view exits the eidetic picture house to the sound of neighboring scuffles, echoed too. A meeting, perhaps, has been called to discuss the department's next course of action. Our detective ought to get a move on, they assume. Having told their tale, though, our witness assumes that the conversation must wrap up sooner rather than later. More questions requiring more answers. These are asked aloud and relate to the relationship between the two involved parties. Not strictly professional, though little more than work brought life to their occasional night-off bar banter. Neither met prior to their military service, with our witness being schooled in England. Though a friendly rivalry brought them together in competition, in our own unseen stead, we see our witness no longer shakes nor sweats, 
sworn belief in their own statements as they confess prior knowledge of their colleagues' political persuasions. An awareness of the manifesto found, though not revealed, by our detective. They admit to never having questioned their congressional leanings more than the occasional didn't like that much. In their own words, our witness states thusly, not mine, not my business, when finally asked about the handbound physical proclamation. A detective agrees, a mutual silence as their neighbor stops arranging rows of fold awayable metal chairs. Time has all but ticked, and now they reach into their breast pocket. Our witness calls themselves a champion of democracy, though they do not use those words. Again, there's a nod of agreement. Our detective retrieves their boon, a touchscreen cell phone tucked behind their index cards, unlocked, searched through, and placed upon the table between them with a video open for viewing. Against our woven will and our best intentions, we're shown the shooting again. Another angle, though there are no time-based gimmicks in this gruesome walkthrough. But you're right now, black and white, seeing mostly our witnesses half of the president's assortment. Shot, drop, drop, panic, screams, our witness then drops to their knees, thin, back in the room with the rest of them. Watch it again, says our detective, though not to us. Still, we follow direction and pay close attention. Say aloud what's wrong with this footage. Our unique assortment takes flight from this transitional space to one recreated by our own grand hive mind. Our fixed rail track takes us not from the first shot, but from the moments leading up to it. Slowed words from the president, presiding over the room with leaded heaviness. A day will come, but that day is not today. It was along those lines, though not in those words. Immediately ahead of the podium, their designated position of power, is an analog clock, ticking away, swallowed by delayed sentiments and empathetic preludes for all but two in the room. Three o'clock strikes, as before. The first shot is fired, though in the split second before our witness can return fire, our position in video is paused and scrapped backwards, purposely. Our ordained omniscience is placed 14 frames prior to the first shot. Intentionally, our gaze now matches that of the video, as we're pulled from our privilege by the specificity of the action. It was, obviously, the strike of three o'clock that triggered this event, but as evidence had suggested, it was not as easy as expected to reach this point. A premeditated murder of this degree required the patience of a saint, so when that fated three o'clock clocked in, it took a few seconds for the deed to be done. Patience. Take your time. It's an important moment, and you don't want to rush it. This patience had been earned, so to speak, and this was evidently not shared by their accomplice. Watch again. While the culprit keeps their eye on the clock, they do so without pattern. Our witness, though, they check every two minutes. Now even, just now, there's nothing up there. It had become little more than a nervous tick, evidence of an unregistered fealty. Watch once more. As the clock strikes three, immediately, our witness goes for the hostage weapon because they knew what to expect. The culprit had intended to die a martyr, with our witness championing democracy. But within moments, our detective has their confession on tape. A lower Oregon has their scapegoat. Team effort, the president will see historical preference over a murderous troop who fell at the last hurdle. The dictaphone box is flicked off, the exit is opened by another, and our detective leaves with no further questions or comments. Clock, clock, clock. If there had been no clock, then why had our accomplice seen one? Dictated by the tick-tock in their ears, they stand and listen. Our effervescent loom captures every panicked instinct, every synapse firing off harder than ever before, perhaps seeking an unlikely escape. No, they seek something hollow. Each wall is padded and therefore they drop to their knees. Pipes. Those PVC pipes once thought to connect to a drainage system, instead simply poke through to the neighboring room, where three rows of the same bulk-ordered black metal chairs face their interrogation chamber. It is the squeak of shoe leather that prompts the chemical explosion within our accomplice. Clear as day across their bloodshot visage, instant action fury channeled into a hectic banging and an erratic begging against that seemingly paper-thin wall. This does not save them from their fate, no. Instead, it reveals it clearer. Our gawping collaboration looks up, as our accomplice does, at a fallen foam panel. 
Behind it, an insulated glass barrier hardly frosted enough to hide the grand appearance of a flooding audience. Tough to make out wholly, our accomplice plugs their ear to the pipe to hear their own execution announced on network television. You have been listening to Two Shots in a Lower Oregon, an episode of Pulp, Surreal Stories from a Nearby Skull, written and directed by Jake Lucy. This production is copyright 2020 by the Sleepy Bones Detective Agency and is intended for enjoyment purposes only. Any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. If you would like to support the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com sbda. Please visit us on the web at sleepybones.agency for more surreal stories.